begin the war today. Yes, Floyd, uh, Doug, and Andy need those. Did you give them? Thank you. Everybody has two piece, two sheets. Two, two. Okay. Everybody needs two. Okay. I'm asking this for two for the sake of doing this. One take notes. The first one take notes. The other one you have as a copy. Okay. You'll get another copy when you leave. Okay. Okay. As we begin today, I'd like to read Matthew 28. 16, 28, 16, Matthew 28, 16, it says this, but the disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and he spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Just before he ascended to heaven, he says, you will receive power when the Spirit of God comes upon you to be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the ends of the earth. In that case, we see these two great commands that he gives his church. That's you and I. So we're going to show today maybe a process that can be a blessing to you. Let us pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, I want to thank you, Lord, for your word. Your word that is holy. Your word is righteous. These aren't these aren't statements of just if you want to do that. It's okay. No, this is a command. These are things you tell us we must do. And so, Father God, I'm asking your leading of your spirit today to guide us in this path, God, that people will just, that all of us will see that this is done by all of us. So lead and guide all that we do and say. Only you can do this as we, as this discussion today, God, it will process, God, help us just to grow in you. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right. <clears throat> as we know that uh, since my back surgery, we've been talking about love. We were talking about love, how much God loves us. And in the process of that, after several weeks, God gets this word righteousness just like ding, 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 ding. It just blew me out of the water. And we've been talking about righteousness for several months now. And righteousness is really the key word of the Bible when it describes who we are. It's the key word of the Bible. And so what I'm recognizing is is that we as God's people really don't understand this word righteousness well. And I'm realizing that church people don't. I can't tell you how many church people I've taken through this, okay? People say, I love you. I go, wow, I didn't know this. Well, no, you probably don't, okay? And, and then when I'm talking to lost people, uh, this past week I'm meeting with a couple. They're elderly couple. They really can't get around much. But I knew them from my past, and, and so God put them on my heart to call them, and they're just weeping. They go, oh, my gosh, this is, this, this is what this would happen. And so the idea is, is, are we called to make disciples? Okay, that's right. You're called to make disciples, aren't you? Right, so often we say, okay, Robin, Jesus loves you so much, just say this prayer. How we say it's magic words and think we're in. They have no idea what they just prayed. They have no idea who they're worshiping. They have no idea or understanding. But they said some words, they think they got a ticket to heaven, now they still, quote, live like hell. <sighs> Nothing's changed in their life. Okay. The idea is we want people to have a comprehension. So what I'm about to share with you, I usually take about 45 minutes with somebody, and we'll sit down and lay out these things. So today what we're going to do is I'm going to share with you and I'm going to pretend, you guys got to pretend you're the people I'm talking to. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to be asking you questions and I need answers. Okay. Okay. This isn't just me standing up here talking. This is going to be like me interacting with somebody who's never received this before. Right. So, so this is, that's the reason take notes. Some of these things you've heard before, but it just puts it in a sequential order that you can take this. Do, you, do all of you have loved ones who don't know the Lord? Do all of you have people around you who are lost? That's right. And understand, I'm going to say this, judgment is soon. All you have to do is look at the world. Everything the word of God is coming to an end. I mean, it seems like it's coming to an end here. And this, I'm asking God to put a fire in us. A fire in us. It's no longer casual Christianity. It's like, God, this, this this is real. This is true. So we pray that prayer. Oh, okay, I guess, I mean... You know, take my heart, take my mind, take my, 
my, my, my, my whole being. Okay, take my heart and form it. Take my mind, transform it. Take my will, conform it to yours, to yours, to yours, O oh Lord. Why? Because I'll tell you what, it's only when that begins to happen in our heart that I'm going to take this seriously. Okay? Otherwise, yeah, I go to church, I might play, might do, I go home. No. This is life changing. Okay? If you look at the early church, this is what they did. Their heart was on fire because they knew. All right? And that's my prayer for us here. All right? All right, with that said. Let's say that statement, Randy. Shall we do that? We got it on our notes here. Take a look. I'm emphatically in love with the right position I have with God and radically pursue it. So when I gather with the people, I hand them the sheet, and I begin with that statement. I'm emphatically in love with the right position I have with God and radically pursue it. And they look at me. I say, do you have any idea what that means? Absolutely not. I go, that's fair. That's fair. Well, let's talk about what it means to have a right position. What does it mean to have a... Don't be afraid to take notes. That's the reason I gave you two sheets, okay? I said, what does it mean to have a right position? I said, for example, I'm married. My wife has a right position in my, in my relationship with her. My wife is able then to... She's able to sign things for me. She's able to speak on my behalf. She's able to, 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 we have the same house together. We have the same cars together. It's all in our name. Well, I, said, I said, if I die, she gets my social security. Why? Because she is in a right position. She has a right position. You know, the guy I talked to this past week, it was interesting. He's, he owned a truck dealership, huge truck dealership, okay, at one time. And I said, whenever you made a decision, Tom, whatever you chose, I mean, you had the right position. When you told somebody to do something, they had to do it, right? Why? Because he were the boss. Very simple. Very simple. And they had a right position. They were your employee. All right. So with that said, then we move into Second Corinthians. Somebody care to read that, please. You see, if you're born again, you have a right position before and with God. I, Rusty Wills, I have a right position before God, with God, because I have been born again. Now, we're going to take a look at this today as we gather together with you here. I want to show you what righteousness is. I want to show you what that means and why I have a right position before God. Does that make sense? And they'll shake their head, yeah. So first thing we have to understand is what is righteousness? What is righteousness? If we look here, it says righteousness is a correct and moral excellence of God. God sets the standard of righteousness. Righteousness is defined by who God is and what he does. Okay, that's very simple. You know, it, God, can do all, do, God can only do what is right because he's always right. God can do no wrong. And then I go into the example. I said, it's like a dog. A dog will always do what a dog does. A dog always sniffs. A dog always scratches. He's never going to meow. He's never going to jump on top of the ceiling or way up top. Why? He doesn't have that ability. That cats do that. Cats meow. Cats jump. Dogs sniff and scratch. That's what they do. They will always, God will always do what God will do. God is always right. It doesn't matter whether you think he's right or wrong. He's always right because he's right. Make sense? And they'll say, yeah. I said, and I went to this man, Tom, you were the boss. Whatever you declared for your business was right. Was that right? He says, yeah. He says, why? Because you own it. When you own something, you get to make the decisions. God owns everything. He's always right. They go, that's right. Well, let's see more about this thing called righteousness. Because I'm saying this because I'm, I'm talking church people. I'm going to tell you right now, folks, most church people aren't saved. Okay? I, I'm not telling you anything. I'm, I'm because look at the church of Laodicea. And I believe that's the age of today. And he says, I wish you were hot or cold, but you're lukewarm, and I vomit you out of my mouth. Why does he vomit us out of the mouth? Because you're not hot. When people are hot, you know they're hot. <sighs> they're full of fire. They're full of excitement. They, they just want Jesus. It's the, it's, it's the, and when they're cold, they know they're cold. It's those who, zzz, yeah, I said the prayer, I'm fine. I'll live however I want. You know, there's no fire in them, okay? So this is a critical, this is critical. 
All right, with that said, so I go to, we go to Isaiah 45. We care to read that, please, somebody. Okay, so make it sure very clear. At the very beginning, God says, there's no other God besides me. There's no none besides except me. He's making it very clear. There's no other. I am he. Because he's the only God, and that's his declaration, he makes this statement. I'm a righteous God. That means I only do what is right. Because he can only do what is right, he's going to be determined who's saved and who doesn't get saved because he's a savior. That's right. Because he's righteous. He always determines what is right. And he's the only one who's going to be able to save. Does that make sense? Okay. Then you move on. Next, somebody care to read that? Okay. Now, why am I encouraging people to read along? Because it engages them. Right? It engages them. You want to get engage them. So the Lord is righteous. Again, making that declaration. He's right. But look what it says. He loves righteousness. Well, I said, told this Tom. I said, Tom, you love trucks, right? Oh, I love trucks. I said, I bet you every truck that goes down the road, you can tell what it is. Oh, yeah. I can tell the engine. I can tell you the make. I can tell you the model. I can tell you everything about that truck. Why is that? You love trucks. I said, if you ask me what the truck looked like, I have no idea. Because I don't love trucks. The point is, God loves righteousness. Why? Because He's righteous. He loves Himself, right? Because He's righteous. Everything about God is right. And look what it says. The upright will behold His face. The upright are people who are righteous. What are we going to do? Oh. That means I get to see Him. Oh. That's a promise. That's a promise. Not only we get to see him in heaven forever and ever. But we also get to sense him right now. Oh, God, you're here in me. Boy, what excited joy that is, huh? All right. Uh, Psalm uh, Acts 3. Somebody care to read that? Now, I'm only sharing this one because it's right after Jesus had risen from the dead. He ascended to heaven. He sent the Holy Spirit upon his church. Peter and John had brought a healing to a man who had been lame all his life. And now they're all coming up to him and they're speaking and they're talking about Jesus. And this is what he says. You disowned the who? So who's he referring to? Jesus. So Jesus is righteous, right? And so we'll come back to that. The next one. Uh, the next two. Somebody care to read that back to back. All right. So, uh, so we go ask the question. What's a throne? I'm asking you that question. What's a throne? Where a king sits. Okay. Okay. And what does a king have? All power and authority, right? Who else sits on a kind of a throne, Alex, situation? A judge, right? He's got a big bench, right? So you've got to understand, justice and righteous, uh, righteous and justice are the foundation. Now, what's a foundation? The base of it all, right? What something's built on. That's absolutely right. So you've got something that's built on. So as I shared with this, this truck guy, I said, when you used to sell your trucks, you could sell them for $300,000. These were magnificent trucks. They had beds, they had refrigerators, they had a little microwave, they had everything in it you could possibly want. But if it didn't have good tires, what did you do with that truck? Didn't go anywhere. Okay, Had to have a foundation. The foundation of God's throne is based on two things. Righteousness and justice. So when he judges on judgment day, when he judges humanity, when he judges you, and when he judges me, he's going to ask the question, are you as righteous as I am? Whoa. Wow. That's quite a question, isn't it? Because if we're not as righteous as he is, we're going to sp- you're going to spend eternity in hell. Of flaming fires. 
And if you are as righteous as you he is, you are get to spend eternity with him. All right. So we understand this, right? Okay. The problem from God's perspective. Humanity is not righteous. What's humanity not? Righteous. righteous. Why do we say that? Because Romans says there's none righteous, not even one. Is that what it says? So that would not include me? Would not include you? All right. So what we've done so far, well, here's, here's what we've done so far. I want to make sure you understand this. God's righteous. And we're going to see what sin is, okay? Now I want to know, there's hope. So don't think there's not hope. I'm taking you through a process. So you want to encourage him here, okay? So God is righteous. Now we're going to get sin's perspective. Now we're going to get God's perspective of sin. Now the problem is, most of us think sin very casually. We don't think it's a big deal. We think it's, mis- it's because it's no big deal. We think it's missing the mark. Oh, it's no big deal. Yes, yeah, I got close enough. It's like cornhole. It's like playing. Anybody ever played horseshoe before? When you played horseshoe, if you got close enough, what did you get? A point, right? That's how we looked. To, we, that's how we see sin. Oh, I got close enough. I'm a good person. You know, I, 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 I pay some tithes once in a while. I go to church. I do all those things. I'm okay. okay? That's how we look at it. That's how we look at sin. It's, but but God, what God says about sin, he makes it very clear. He says, if I'm out in a shooting range, and Carl, you're a dead-eye shooter. But you know, the day I went with you shooting, you hit the target a lot. But you also missed. <sighs> okay? I looked at you and go, oh, Carl, man, you're a shooter. Oh, man, boom, 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 boom. You got it. But then it's sometimes you didn't hit. Sin is not, it's missing the mark. See, God expects us. It says in, in James, it says, you, you commit one sin, you commit them all. That's the reason we have James there, okay? So the idea is, I got hit the mark every time. Does everybody hit the mark every time? No. We miss it, don't we? Okay. That's God's perspective of sin. Set B, it says, uh, the sinfulness of sin, it's lawlessness. Somebody care to read John, uh, 1 John 1, 3, 4 there, please. What is sin? sin is what do we do with criminals? Sin is a criminal it's a criminal act. Do you ever think of sin that way? Most people don't. It's a crime against God. And we know what people, we know what we do with criminals. We throw them in jail. Why? Because they, they, it's a crime against society. Now, this is just society. This is a crime against the almighty, holy, righteous God. So what's God saying we deserve? Punishment. Punishment. Okay. Let's move on. Sin is always against God. In Psalm 51, it says, Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And what I do at that point, I should have put this in here, put put, uh, 2 Samuel. But, But the idea is, I'm sorry, 1 Samuel. I go to the story of David, why he wrote this. And I told the story, and I've shared this before, about the story of David. When David's sitting on his throne, he's sitting, uh, his, he sent his soldiers out to war. And as they went to war, he's, he's in the, he, he who is left behind is in the city of Jerusalem. He goes on top of the roof of his house, and he looks down. He sees this beautiful babe. Oh, she's gorgeous. She's hot in David's eyes. He looks down at her, calls her in. She's married. That's one of her soldiers' uh, wives. Doesn't matter. He goes to bed with her. She becomes pregnant. Now there's a problem. What's he going to do? He says, I know what I'll do. I'll get my way out of this. I'll call her husband back from the line, and I'll bring him in. Great. A brilliant idea for evil. How can I, how can I cover up? Do you know any government that covers up stuff? <sighs> okay, right. Okay, so he's covering up. So what does he do? He Uriah comes in. He says, Uriah, how are things going? Hey, they're fine. Great. Hey, have a great night. Uriah is a, whole, is a, is a good man. What does he do? He sleeps in the, in the alleyway. David says, what? You didn't go be with your wife? Second night, come on in. <coughs> what does he do? He gets him drunk. He says, no, go get with your wife. He doesn't go with his wife. So he sends him a letter to Joab saying, and he seals it. Gives it to Uriah, takes it to Joab, the commander of chief, and says, put him in the front line, draw the army back, get him killed. 
<coughs> that's done. What happens? David thinks, all right, I'm set free. Nobody knows. I'm in good shape. Baby's born. Next thing we know, Nathan a prophet comes up and says, David, let me tell you a story. One day there was, there was a rich man and a poor man. The rich man had tons of cow, cattle, tons of sheep, had everything he wanted. Then you had this poor man. He had one sheep. Oh, he loved that sheep. He ate with that sheep. He slept with that sheep. Oh, he loved his sheep. But one day the rich man had a, a gathering and a banquet. So instead of taking his, one, his, uh, his sheep, he went to the poor man and took that sheep. And, and David said, that man should die. And Nathan said, you're the man. All right. At that point, David wrote this statement. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil. Now, it doesn't mean he didn't sin against Uriah. It doesn't mean he didn't sin against Bathsheba. But what it does mean, he sinned against God. Because if he was in a right relationship with God, he would have never done those evil things. Now, let me ask you, have you ever done evil things? Is it because you were out of a relationship with God? That's right. That's exactly what begins to happen. Okay. So David was making very clear, sin is against God and God only, because if we're in right relationship with Him, we're not going to do those other things. Amen? Sin is failure to love God. Somebody care to read that? What's the key word that keeps running through that one? All. What does all mean? Everything, right? Everything we got. So the idea is I'm to love him. If I'm not, is this a command? So if I'm not keeping this command, what am I doing? Is that what it says? It's, 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 it's love them all. And if he, I have a command and I don't do it, it's called sin. How do you do with that? Right. So, Next one, sin is failure to glorify God. It says, whether then you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of who? So whatever you do, all. Again, that word all, right? So if I'm drinking this little water. Mm. Oh, thank you, Lord. Am I doing it for the glory of God? So it means everything I do, I'm to drive for the glory of God. When I'm up in the morning, I wash my face. God, thank you so much for this fresh water. Thank you, God, for this bath I'm able to take. Thank you, Lord, for, for the ability to have this breakfast, God. Thank you, God, I could drive over here today. Thank you, God. It's that heart of perpetual praise and honor and glory to God. If I don't have that, what am I doing? Sinning. Is that what it says? Do all for the glory of God. See, we take sin. We don't think it's that big a deal. God's perspective. God's perspective. Let's move on. It says sin is godless and ungodly. It's not recognizing God. It's I do it my way. <sighs> how many people, that's their theme song. I can't tell you how many people. Who has it recently died? He had that sung at their funeral. Chris, I remember a couple funerals that I've done with you. The person, they had that singing in the background. I did it my way. And I think, oh, dear God, have mercy. How many times we do it our way? Yeah. That's, that's godlessness. That's ungodly. Sin is rebellion and insubordination. Somebody care to read that? Somebody care to read that? Whoa. Whoa. You know what divination is? What is it? It's witchcraft. That's right. How does God view rebellion? Witchcraft. That's what he's saying. Is that what he's saying? Again, this is how God views sin. Again, quit thinking how you view sin. How does God view sin? So every time God tells me to do something and I don't do it, what is it? It's divination. It's, it's, it's as divination. It's rebellion. Whoa. See, we don't think sin like this. But that's how God sees sin. Whoa. 
And then he called it insubordination, equity, and idolatry. Idolatry. Idolatry is putting something ahead of God. I can, you know, we can idol our wives. We can idol my belief system that's not of God. I can idolize anybody around me. I can, we can do that. We idolize our phone. We idolize YouTube. We idolize all that stuff. Whoa. You know, example that I often use is, again, with my son. My son's a captain in the army. Our son's a captain in the army. If he tells the general, the general says, do this, and Kyle says, general, you can shove it. <laughs> What's going to happen? Yeah, he's going to be he's going to be out of the army. All right, let's move on. Sin is treachery and betrayal. Judas betrayed Jesus for what? 30 pieces of silver. How often we betray Jesus? How many times we compromise Jesus? How many times we, we compromise him? We do it all the time. We let the world dictate what I'm going to do. We also, in a sense, betray him. Uh, and, and Peter said he wouldn't leave Jesus, yet he denied him three times. Jesus, I'll never leave you, but we come to a situation, boom, <laughs> I, I run. Sin is universal. Somebody care to read that? Who sins? So it's all of us, isn't it? And at that point in time, I, I often go back to the story of Genesis, where at the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he said, I'm going to make man in my, let us make man in our image. And he made man in his image. That's us. We were in perfect unity with God. God, you had first Adam, he had God, just the whole, I mean, just they were just perfect oneness. He says, hey, Adam, you name everything. So Adam got to name everything. But who's working through him to name everything? He's in perfect unity with God. Absolute oneness with God. But God gave him one command. You shall not eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For if you do, you will what? You will surely die. We ate the fruit, and at that moment, everyone died. Adam and Eve died. And that DNA of their sinful nature was passed on to all creation. Okay? I want to make that sure. You make sure you understand that, okay? That it passed on to all creation. So with that said, he was the first Adam. And we see that it was absolutely notorious. So all people are sinful now. All people except one. We'll get to that in a second. Sins an abomination. It's, it, it's, for the devious are an abomination to the Lord. What's an abomination? Here's my example of abomination. Let's say Lynn and I bought a little cottage. Okay? And we go to this cottage, sight unseen, but we heard there's this beautiful cottage. We could get it for $3,000. So we borrowed money from Doug, and we went out to this cottage, and we, and we went to this cottage, and we never saw it before, and we opened the door, and as we opened the door, there are... 40 dead cats laying in there. <laughs> As we open this door, the stench would be so foul. We couldn't get in there because it is so wicked. As Paul Washer said, this is the most important description of sin. It's stench to God's nose. We don't think sin that way. Are you with me so far? Okay. So what we have here, and again, the reason we're teaching this today is you guys can do this. You got the sheep. I've given you an extra one to take home. You can use this. And we'll get more if you need them. Let's turn the page. Here's the problem. God is righteous. Humans are sinful. How can we be saved? That's a great question. So for all of us have become like, when somebody read that, that uh, Isaiah 64, please. Okay, so that word for filthy rags, a woman's menstrual period. He says, all our righteous deeds, everything I do to try to do the right thing, it's nothing but like a filthy rag. Look what it says, that next line. Let's read that together. All religion is humans by their own righteous efforts trying to earn their salvation by good works. It's impossible. I'll never forget, and I shared this before, when I went down to the first National Muslim Day of Prayer. 
and came across this man. And this man who was, who, who was a Muslim man, he was costing a couple young Christians, and the, you could tell he was just overwhelming them, and God says, stop. And so I went over to the young man, and I said, can I ask you a question? He says, sure. I said, the question I have for you is this. He says, how many good works do you have to do to get to heaven? Because I understand the Quran says you have, only, you have to do so many good works to get to heaven. And he says, I don't know. I said, so what you're telling me that if you're going to do all these good works, but you'll never know if you're good enough to get to heaven. And he says, that's right. I said, you see, the difference between you and myself as Christians is this. All religion is man trying to get to heaven. It's earning. Oh, I went to church. I did this tithe. I did this good work. I helped this old lady across the street. You know, I go to mass every day. I do this. I do that. But the deal is, that's not getting you in. Christianity is not about religion. It's about a relationship. It's God initiated that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. See, God doesn't want you to perish. God wants you to have eternal life. That's how much he loves you so much. See, the price paid for something determines its value. And the bottom line is, he values you so much. You've got to understand this. He loves you so much. He values you. When, I, when you think value, what do you think of value? It's worth. It's worth, you worth something to God. He gave his life for you. Now I'll pay, I'll pay a dollar. You'll pay a buck for that drink, won't you? That water, whoever's water it is. Okay. You know, I'll, I'll pay 10 bucks for this little, this little carton here. This is wonderful. Okay. I won't pay 40 bucks. I'll go to Chick-fil-A. I'll pay a dollar for two eggs in the morning. But I won't pay 10. Okay. What's the point? The price paid for something determines its value. Christ sees you so valuable. So He's so much worth. He sent His only Son. It says the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. He loves you. He loves you. Now let's find out the extent of this love. Let's do that. Somebody care to read 2 Corinthians again, please. So God had to do something for us to become righteous. So it's his initiative. But let's find out what that is. Jesus, <coughs> God's righteous son from eternity, became a man. He walked this earth fully God and fully man. So understand, he was just like you and I when he walked this earth. He needed to take a bath. Okay, he needed to, he, he, he needed to, he got tired. He had to eat physical food. He did everything that you and I did, all right? He's the same, he's fully human. But it's number two, he did one thing, he never sinned. Jesus lived his human life righteously by faith, led by the Holy Spirit. In other words, Jesus only spoke what his father told him to speak. He only, he, he only did what his father told him to do. He never did anything on his own initiative. Why? Because he was lived in faith. He was in constant communion with God. Like the first Adam before he sinned. Jesus is in constant communion with God. Amen? Now, on the cross, here's what happened. Jesus walked this earth for 33 years. The last three and a half years, he was serving. And it just he's out ministering and showing and revealing the kingdom of God. But then what did he do? On that cross, we've all, he, did you see the passion of the Christ? And when he saw that, didn't that kind of make you moan and groan? It hurt, didn't it? To see the physical pain. Most people have seen that. Yeah. I said, but that's not the bad part. The bad part's this part. Here again, here's an example. On number three, on the cross, all my our sins were transferred to his body like a paycheck wired to your bank account. Do all of you get paid? Yeah. Do they write a check and they hand it to you anymore? 
No. Oh, yours might do. Okay, okay you're, you're unusual, okay? <sighs> but most places, so security, everything else, what do they do? They literally, they make a direct deposit. It's like a wired account. Here's Jesus hanging on the cross. And all of your sin, all of my sin, is transferred. Zit, zit, zit of the world is transferred to his body. Now, he, had he ever sinned before? I want you to imagine. Just, I mean, this is just a, just a thumbnail. It's, it's, but imagine the other night I was sitting in a sauna. It got up to 150 degrees. Okay. Now imagine if I opened the door of that sauna and then I walked into 200 minus zero. What would that do to my body? Ah! Jesus, shock value. He never knew sin. He was perfect. He was the righteous one, right? Is that what it said earlier? So all the sin of the world is now devastating his body. And then it said the wrath of God came down upon him. It said it pleased the father to crush his son. And there Jesus is. Oh, I just, it was dark for how many hours? Three hours. Why? Because the wrath of God was coming upon him. He was taking your punishment of the sins that you did, that I did, for the purpose why he came. There had to be a sacrifice. There had to be justice. Somebody had to pay the price. It was Jesus who paid the price. Say that with me. Jesus paid the price. And so there he is, taking all the sin of the world in his body. So what does he do? He took the punishment of our sins. Number six, he died, was buried, descended into hell. Number seven, he rose from the dead to show the victory over death, sin, and the devil. He said, devil, I beat you. Sin, you no longer reign. I am one. I showed that I'm the righteous one. I'm the victorious one. Wow. And what did he say? He ascended to heaven to sit on the right hand of the Father. And he said he would send us a helper, the Holy Spirit. John 16. Somebody care to read that, please. Okay, thank you. So you read this. He said the helper will only come, what, if he goes away. So Jesus had to go, and then he would send the helper. And when he, the helper, he sends the helper, this is what he says. He's going to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and justice. So before you're born again, you're walking in sin, right? Okay, sin is your master. So what the Holy Spirit's going to do, and he's pursuing everyone. It's a matter of how we want to respond. So the Holy Spirit's trying to get our attention. Boom, boom, boom. And we see all kinds of events happen in our life. We just often refuse to see. But when the Holy Spirit comes and he touches your heart, he's going to convict you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Sin, in the category, he's going to show you how wicked you are. Okay, he's going to show you how wicked you are. He's going to show you that you're lustful, that you're not obedient to God. He's going to show you that sin's an abomination. He's going to show you how filthy you are. And none of your righteous deeds will get you to heaven. No matter what you think. He's going to show you how righteous he is. He's going to show you that it's none righteous, not even one. He's going to show you that I'm a sinner and I, I just need him and God's perfect. And he's the only one who can save you. He's going to show you judgment. He's going to show you that there's a judgment day when you're either going to go to heaven or you're going to go to hell and it'll be determined if you receive the gift of Christ. He's going to show you that. And when he shows you that and you recognize that you're sinful and unclean and there's nothing good about you and it's only him who's righteous, it's only him who can give you salvation, what you're going to do then, you're going to, you're, it says number two, you're going to humble yourself. And you're going to repent of your sin. You're going to surrender your life to Jesus. 
and believe and declare Jesus Lord, at that moment you become born again. <coughs> now understand, a lot of people think, oh, I, I'm going I'm to receive Jesus to get the ticket to heaven. If that's the reason you want to be born again, you don't really want to be born again. Because all you're doing is wanting to get an insurance policy. And that's not what this is about. See, when you become born again, what happens is you're reconciled back to God. And what happens at the minute you repent and receive Christ the Lord, His righteousness now is transferred to you. Boom! Here it comes. And in my inner man, my inner self, I become new. <coughs> and I become born again. And I'm assured of a right relationship I have now with God. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay? Okay, mind you, that again, and out of that, I get to heaven. But I have to have that right relationship with God. Okay? And how many people say, say these magic words, da, 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 and you're in. No, they, 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 there has been no transformation. You'll know that you're saved when your life is transformed. Okay? All right. Number four. Now I'm declared the righteousness of Righteous of God in Christ. I'm restored to a right relationship with God. God sees me as righteous. And on judgment day, he will look at me and see I am clothed with the righteousness of Jesus. And at that point, I talk about an umbrella. If I go outside and it's wet, I'm going to wear an umbrella. Why am I going to wear an, have an umbrella? Why is that? So rain doesn't get on my head, right? So I'm safe. He says, well, in essence, what's happened on Judgment Day, the wrath of God's coming down. Am I covered with the umbrella of righteousness? Okay, that's the deal. Wow. And if I'm, come pro I'm covered, man, on Judgment Day, I, I'm with everybody else, they're going to be judged. But I'm, you're going to see me righteous. Amen. The umbrella's Christ. That's right. That's right. Good. Now, what's the deal? Now we live and from our righteous position in Christ. Okay, now I live in and from my righteous position in Christ. I am now declared righteous. Now I want to live righteously. And that song that we had up there, Take My Heart. Okay, Andy will get back to it here. Okay. Take my heart, form it. Take my mind, transform it. Take my will, conform it to yours. That becomes all I want. That becomes my life. Okay? That's my heart. And I want other people to know them. Huh? And so then I have some Bible verses underneath it. And I, we call it lifestyle Christianity. That's my lifestyle. That's what I am now. It's not, oh, I, I'm that way only in church. No, it's who I become. I live according to the Word of God. That's my heart. I'm living in faith, led by the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you something, folks. You can only live righteously if you're living in faith. Amen. You cannot live righteously living in the flesh. I can only live righteously living in faith, led by the Holy Spirit. Okay? The Holy Spirit needs to take control. God, God, I surrender to your spirit today. Lord, Holy Spirit, just take control of my life. Let me yeah, you have a deep faith. Okay? All right. Now, with that said, then I go into Ephesians 4. How do, I, how do I live this righteous position? I put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in what? And what? So my new self is created in the likeness of God. Whoa. That's what the Bible says. Do I believe that? So now I live like that. Dear God, help me. And it says, put, I have to intentionally every morning. And then I tell the story that I told about my linen. It's a, that's a great story. I'm going to tell you what. You, you haven't heard of Mimi. But on our, on him, our honeymoon night, okay, after the honeymoon night, I got up early in the morning. And I put on my clothes, and we we're going to go out. And she looked at me and said, you're really not going to wear that, are you? And I said, yeah. She goes, plaids and stripes don't match. So she had me put on all the clothes that I had brought. I put them on the bed. And she says, Rusty, do you realize not one thing matches? Not one thing matches. Okay? When we get home, this is what we're going to do. 
We're going to box all that up. We had two-bedroom apartment. We're going to put that in the back room, and we're going to get you new clothes. So every morning, I had a ch when I got up then, I had a choice. Do I want to put on the new clothes, or do I want to go pick up the plaids and stripes? Okay? And that's the truth with us. We're born-again people. If we're born-again people, what that means is I'm going to put on my new self. That means I'm going to that closet of righteousness and I'm going to put on love and I'm going to put on grace and I'm going to put on hope and I'm going to put on humility and I'm going to put on love and I'm going to put on all these attributes of Christ. Huh? Amen? It becomes who I am. So I put him on. And we've got another sheet out there confessing who God is. If you, I, somebody, I think all of you have it, but if not, Floyd has some for you. All right? Then I go through, go to Romans. It says, somebody care to read that, please? Sanctification means being holy. It means being transformed, okay? So he says, have him been freed from sin. So what have I become now? Freed from sin. It means I, sin is no longer master over me. It means now I become a slave to righteousness. Now what's a slave? Somebody's under the authority of somebody, right? You're required to do what that person says, correct? Now I'm a slave to what? Righteousness. Now as a slave to righteousness, look what this is. Now pre, this is what I'm called to do. Present your members as slaves to righteousness. You know what's really cool? How God works? Doug picked this song out for Sunday. Okay. This song, he picked, he, God used him to pick this song. This line right here, this is what it means to present your, it really means present your, 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 your members. Your members is your mind, your heart, your body, your soul. Take my heart and form it. I presented that to God. Take my mind, transform it. Take my will, conform it to yours. Because I will tell you right now, if you, if you offer those three things to God, that means your hands are going to do what you're called to do. Your tongue's going to speak right because you've, you've taken it. You're asking God, take all of this. You're presenting it. Huh? Ooh. Isn't this good? Isn't this good? Then seek first his kingdom and what? His righteousness. What's the word first mean? <laughs> first, right? It's very simple, isn't it? See, God isn't tough. He doesn't make this. He says, here's how to do it. We make it too tough. Seek first his kingdom. Now, who's the king of the kingdom? God. Seek him. Then it says, seek righteousness. That means seek the position he says I am. What's the position I'm in? He's declared me holy. I'm the light of the world, the salt of the earth. He's, he said, this is who I am. Now live it. Ooh. Then it says, all scriptures inspired by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correcting, for training in what? I'm going to tell you right now, folks. The reason some young men and people I know, they say, oh, I want Jesus, I want Jesus, I want Jesus. Guess what? They're not in the Word of God. They don't even know where their Bibles are. <laughs> what does it say in Matthew? It says very simple. In Mark, it's, it says the same thing. It says when, when the devil has been come out, the evil spirits come out of something, and it goes away, it'll, and it comes back. If he finds the place empty, he's going to fill it back up. Why? Because it has not been filled with the word of God. And I'm here to tell you, folks, if you want to walk in righteousness and you want to walk in holiness, you must. And I don't mean this in a legalistic term, but you're going to have a heart to want to be in the word to touch your heart to grow you in him. I mean, that's just how it is. I mean, when I don't read the Word, which is very, very solid, when I don't read the extent of the Word of God every day that, that I, I feel called to leave, I feel empty. I just feel empty. 
I feel like I'm trying to live this day by myself. Okay. And it's, it's just, it becomes toxic. Okay? It's when I'm in the Word of God. And I eat it and I drink it. And, uh, oh God, it just, it touches me. And oh, 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 I mean, I love sitting down with my wife at dinner time. Oh, what did the Lord show you? Oh, 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 here we go. And before you know, we're talking Jesus and we're just having a great time. Why? Because that's what I'm called to do. That's what she's called to do. And oh, who's a better topic to talk about than the one who we live for? Let me ask you this. Does this make sense? Is this something you think you can use? Is this a tool? This is a tool. That's all this is, is a tool. But this is a tool that we can use with people who don't know the Lord. See, what you do before you do it, you pray. You pray, and that's Holy Spirit lead me. See, it says, go make disciples of all nations. Okay, does it say only pastors? I don't, I don't see that there. Does anybody else see that there? Okay, I, I don't see that there. Okay. It says, go make disciples. He says, you will be my witnesses to all Jerusalem, Judea, and all the ends of the earth. Who's he talking to? Everyone who knows him. Okay, so here's the deal, folks. All of us are called to do this. But I will guarantee you, if you sit down with church people, they will have no clue about this. And that's what saddens me so much. But that's the reality of the world we're in. But all I know is we live in a world that's lost, hurting, lonely, broken, huh? And they don't know this. And so it's been great sitting with people. And some people go, that's good, I understand, but it hasn't changed their life. That's, God only can change them. But now they know the reality. They know the reality. It isn't just say these magic words because Jesus is a nice guy. It's saying this is who God is. He's righteous. I'm sinful. I'm an abomination, my sinful nature, okay, et cetera, et cetera. But then here's what he did for me. Here's why he did it for me. God so loved the world. And then it shows when his righteousness hits me, I'm now a new man. I'm a new woman. I'm a new creation. Now I live in a right position with God. And on judgment day, that umbrella of the blood of Christ, of righteousness, will be upon, is on me. And he's going to bypass me because I'm in right relationship. And as a person who's in a right relationship with God now, I want to live righteously. Not because I have to. I want to. I can't help but be. I can't help it. An old lady needs to cross the... I'm going to go help her. Why? Because she needs help. Make sense? It becomes who you are. All right. Okay. Oh, man. What does everybody think? I mean, be honest. Keep feedback, feedback, feedback. Yeah, Joanne. Absolutely. That's right. That's right. It says, go make disciples, right? That's what you're talking about. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. And I'm, I'm, I'm not discarding the Jesus prayer. I've just seen too many situations where people said these little words. That's right. They're, they're, not they're not doing the That's right. The that's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. So it has to be if you talk to somebody and they say a prayer, then you should continue in that. That's right. There need to be a, some format that they can gather together, right? They that's right. Capability. capability. That's right. 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 So discipline is really a critical key, isn't it? Yeah. That's right. We have to get together and, you know, come here, do whatever, because as I told Paul one time, it wasn't coming to church, it was what was in your heart, but he took that the wrong way. And then he wasn't coming to church, he was doing everything else, he was going to gun shows, he was going to um, shooting matches and all that, and he wasn't coming to church, and I said, dude, wait a minute, man. What I said to you was correct in a way, but you took it 
one, you still have to put God first. You know, Seek you first his kingdom, absolutely. righteousness, that's right. You can do those other things, but you have to put him first. I, my, my wife and I did that for years. You know, if, if something came up, we would, you know, oh, we can skip church. We, we got to go do this. We got to go do that. And that was really killing me. And, I, and it ruined, I think, in a long sure. run, it ruined my marriage. You know, but but after that, you know, God kind of <laughs> grabbed a hold of me and threw me into church. And, and it, it made a massive difference. That's right. Yeah. So, but, but the idea, we have to gather together. I can't say it enough. Bible studies, you know, whatever it might be. Prayer gatherings, just coming and seeking God together as community. That's what we are. All right. Any other comments before we go, before we pray? Yeah, yeah. No, no. This Wednesday's at 9.30. 9.30, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, right, right. Okay, yeah, okay. Anybody else? Anybody else? Okay. Does this make sense? Okay, okay. If you can see ways to improve this, let me know. But this is kind of what God's given, and and, uh, I I, I presented this to a missionary. And he goes, oh, Rusty, you need to publish this. I mean, uh, yeah, I don't mean, I miss, but he says, this is really good tool for people to use. And my prayer, and you know, the other stuff, uh, where we are in Christ and stuff. Mimi, you probably don't have that. So, Floyd, make sure that Mimi gets those other two sheets, okay? Okay, and anybody, does everybody have both sheets? Okay, all right. Okay, yes, but I mean, just don't, you have them at home, yes. Please. Yep. Yep. Health food. Thank you. I was just yeah. Oh, good. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Talk to me. Talk to me. Talk to me. Because I just want to share. Okay. If you need to be more explicit, so it's not be it. Just minister, it's not 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 just Amen. Amen. God is good. God is good. All right. Well, let's close in prayer, shall we? Father God, we just thank you so much, God, for your kindness. Thank you, God, that you are righteous. Thank you that you are righteous. And I thank you, Lord, your foundations based on righteousness and, and justice. It's the foundation. It's the foundation. I thank you you're going to judge the world on righteousness. I thank you, Lord, that you showed us how, un- how sinful we are. And sin's an abomination. I pray the reality of how sinful we are is truly deep in our heart to understand the condition, how you feel towards sin. And I pray, God, that we understand that that the problem that we had, we could not be saved on our own accord. Oh, God, you had to initiate it, which you did, and by your grace and grace alone. And I thank you, God, we're saved by grace through faith. And I thank you, Jesus, you came into this world and all of our sins were transferred to your body. And I thank you that you took the punishment. You were just. Justice was done. And I thank you, you rose from the dead. And I thank you, you sent your Holy Spirit upon us. And I thank you that when we are convicted of sin and convicted of righteousness and judgment, and we confess our sins to you and surrender our life to you, God, we are born again. And I thank you, now the process begins. We're now declared righteous in your eyes. And we grow in that righteousness. And we grow into a deeper understanding of you. And we grow in more in love with you. And we grow. And so, Lord, we cry out, take my heart, take my mind, take my, my spirit, God. Take it all, God. We want to walk like Christ. 
No wonder you said in Scripture, imitate God, beloved children. Walk in love. God, you don't tell us to do those things unless it's possible to do it through the power of the Spirit. I wonder you've declared us righteous. Now we have that ability, not in our own self, but by your Spirit surrendering to you and your Spirit moving through us. What an awesome God you are. What an awesome God you are. And we just praise you and we thank you. We worship you. We love you. We just pray, Father God, that, that what you taught us today, that isn't something just Pastor Rusty does, but all of us do. Help us, God, put that on our heart, that we can sit down with people and walk through the sheet. We can give them a sheet, God, and say, here, use this. Use this. And take it. And just share them the truth of your name. So, God, we thank you so much for this time today. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for this word. Now, Father, transform us as a body and see people in love with you and use us to bring people to Christ. God, we trust that someday we'll be out of this facility to another place, God. God, where there'll be more people hearing this truth, God. So, God, we love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Joyful and triumphant, O come ye, O come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the King of Ages. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him. O come, let adore him Christ the Lord the highest most holy light of light eternal born of a virgin a mortal he comes son of the father now we Come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Sing, choirs of angels, sing in exaltation. Sing, all ye citizens of heaven above. Glory to God in the highest. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him, Christ the Lord. Yeah. This happy morning, Jesus, to thee be your glory given. Word of the Father, now in flesh appearing. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Oh, Father, we thank you, Lord. We adore you. We worship you. We love you. We thank you for your presence here today. We thank you for the truth you shared with us. Now, Lord, let us live that lifestyle, Christianity. We live righteously. We live in the right position we have with you in faith. Use us today to to just bless others, let, remembering that we're the light of the world. Every place our foot shall tread, you've given to us. And for this we give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.